what happens when all of your training engagements that are live and in person disappear? That's what happens to many of us. And that's what happened to my guest today. I'm Linda Katz-Wilner, and I'm here today with Bill Gertine to talk about being a successful speaker and what it takes. Hmm. Bill is known throughout the sports industry as the 800 pound gorilla of sales performance. His sales training methodology is used in ticket sales departments of over 100 professional teams. Bill is an award-winning author of two books on sales and marketing. And his new virtual keynote presentation called The Seven Voices in Your Head is based on his extensive research in motivation, peak performance, and mental health. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But I'd like to welcome Bill Gertin. Thanks, Linda. It is an honor and a privilege to be a part of your program. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Now, Bill, let's start with this. People often say, I want to get paid to speak. And, and especially now in COVID, when people lost their jobs, they'd say, I'm going to go out and be a professional speaker. Now, you've been paid to speak as a sales trainer, a keynote speaker, and even a master of ceremonies, both live and virtually. So what would you tell somebody if they said, I want to get paid to speak like you do, how do I do that? <laughs> you know, it looks so easy, doesn't it, Linda? You just stand up in front of the camera, you go in front of the audience, you just tell your story and you get paid a big fat sum and everybody's happy. And what people don't see is often the work that it takes behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And what I tell them is that, first of all, you have to have a story that's worth telling. And there are many, many stories that people have that they've told for years, but yet they're not put together in a way that's valuable to someone else. What you have to ask yourself is, would someone pay to hear my story? But then take it one step backward from that and say, what problems do people have today that they would be willing to pay me to hear this story that would solve that potential problem? That's where most people go awry. They think, my story is so great, everybody's gonna wanna hear this, and there's only so many people that can go on the Moth Radio Hour on NPR. It, the, you have to have something that resonates with someone enough to be able to want them, to be able to be engaged with them, so it solves some base problem, or somehow brings solutions to bear that people would pay to be able to have. Very few people will pay you simply because you want to be paid. If you want to be a, an MC or you want to have a speaking engagement or you want to be a uh, keynoter of some sort, you have to be able to do the work beforehand. And there are several organizations that can help you organize that, one of which is the National Speakers Association, but there are several others perhaps right there in your hometown that can help you do that. Right. E even starting for some people with Toastmasters or just having a private coach can certainly yeah. help them with that. Yep. That's great. Now, tell us a little bit about your journey. Where did you start? Because you, you were talking about sales and ticket sales for sports teams. Where did you start and where are you now? You know, when, you're, when everybody's in school, they often take the, the courses they think that they're going to be in their life's journey. It never really seems to quite work out that way. I was destined to be a radio guy. I was a, a closet DJ with the wooden spoon and the, you know, mm -hmm. un, and the, under the covers for a very long time. And at 16, I went up to the Dirksen Federal Building in Chicago. I live about an hour south of there. And myself and four other buddies of mine got our third class radio operator's license, which you had to have at that time in order to be on the air. And I was the only one of the five that actually used it. I was actually on the air at 16, which at that time made me one of the youngest licensed radio broadcasters in the state of Illinois. And that was my destiny. I was going to be the next Larry Lujak, who at the time was the top 40 DJ god of WLS here in Chicago. And at 21, I figured out where the money was, and it was not on the air. It mm -hmm. was in the sales side. And so I began a sales career on the broadcast advertising sales side of radio and was fairly proficient at it. Became the top sales guy, then a senior salesman, and then sales manager, and then general manager of a property or two, and actually owned a piece of a station for a time. And then I saw the iPod, and this was early 2000s or so. 
And when I first saw that you could put a thousand songs in your pocket, I really thought it was the death of local radio. Mm -hmm. I was wrong, of course, because local radio is still alive and well, but I started to look for something that I felt I could be a, some sort of a, a, a contributor in, that I would help others get where they needed to go. And so I had a laundry list. I wanted to be a published author. I wanted to kind of speak in front of people, but I didn't know what I was going to talk about. Sports was kind of a fun thing for me. I didn't know kind of how that was going to work. But so I started really little, and this is how most people start out. You become a generalist meaning that you speak on lots of different things. And so when somebody would say, hey, do you speak on customer service? I said, sure, I, do you speak on team building? Yeah, I can do that. And so all of a sudden you become this expert on everything, but not really an expert on one thing. And what's important as you begin your speaking journey is that you find the thing that you can be known for. It was taught to me like this, to be known for what you know. Generalists are not paid all that much because just about anybody can be a generalist. But to be a specialist in one thing and to drill really deep into that can be where the riches are. And so I chose early on to be more of a trainer because I got to know that training piece very well in my training of sales reps on my staff at the, in radio. But then also to be trained in a very specific niche to the ticket sales departments of pro sports teams, which I was introduced to by my good friend Tom Sheridan, who at the time had seen me speak on a customer service person in the south suburbs and said, wow, you've really got a lot of energy. You should do this thing that people go around the country and train all these sales reps. And for me, it was like, oh, I had no idea. And so once you just start doing stuff, you start to realize what else is out there. And then you begin to network and do a really good job. And then all of a sudden, what I've learned and in the sports industry is it's a very small fraternity. If you're really good, most people will figure that out. And if you're really bad, people will figure that out too. And so I've been fortunate over an almost 20 year career now to work with that many teams and to be invited back more often than not. And, and you said something very interesting. You, you said you're a trainer. For, for those who are listening, there are trainers and there are keynote speakers. Yes. How do you see the difference? Oh, they're, they're night and day. And before I knew the difference, I thought they were just about the same. You mm -hmm. just get up and you talk for 30 minutes and you know, you're the after dinner guy after the rubber chicken circuit and, and you can just talk, but that's not the case. No, there's, there is an element to keynote speaking that needs to be, you almost need to take your listeners on a little bit of a roller coaster ride mm -hmm. uh, to be able to structure something that has purpose and has meaning but is structured in such a way that isn't necessarily training, but brings people to a certain place and has a certain th element that you are helping them to get toward. That mm -hmm. they start in a certain place and because of your influence in their lives, they are transformed in some way. Keynotes need to be transformational. Mm -hmm. Instructors, however, those people who are educators or trainers need to be mm -hmm. educational. They also need to inspire, but you also need to have very significant substance attached to that that people mm -hmm. can act on and say, I know now how to do that and to actually help them perform that which you've just learned. So there's some more follow up and there's some one on one that takes place in training mm -hmm. where keynoting is much more from the dais, from the platform, allowing many others to be able to absorb the message that you have that's far more structured and many times more uh, emotional in nature. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and I'm a trainer myself, but not necessarily a keynoter. But I think there are some people who are using keynotes to drive more business. Oh, of course. Right, yes. so, so it, it, they're different. They're different oh. ways of delivering information. Yes, keynoters will sometimes say, if you'd like to go deeper, there is this 21 day course that you can take of mine or my five week deep dive or mm -hmm. something like that to be able to encourage people to do more with them if they have been moved in some way to go more and to want to be more a part of their lives with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's in many cases, those keynoters that have been super successful have been able to exist in the lives of those audiences far more than simply a, a one time and out deal. And, uh, it really depends on the keynote and whether or not that's the kind of thing that you're comfortable with. But right. many keynoters have made a very comfortable living beyond the keynote themselves as they introduce their message to the, the masses and then begin to work with each of those masses one on one in coaching and training and, and in uh, masterminding. And, and in 2021 or back in 2020, that was a big differentiator. If you only had the keynote, 
what do you do now? So I think the people who have a more robust, um, more robust inventory of services they can provide did better last year when the face-to-face -face keynotes just stopped. Yeah. So I had a double whammy in that not only did keynotes mm -hmm. stop, but sports stopped. Yes. For those who were following sports and understand 2020, there were very few fans in stands, which meant there were very few tickets sold, mm -hmm. which meant that a lot of people I had already trained have either been laid off or have moved on to greener pastures. So literally my entire market dried up. Mm. And, so what did you do about that? <laughs> well, after a lot of soul searching, uh, I was forced to really look inside myself and say, where do I go to next? Now, mm -hmm. fortunately, I started a company with several of uh, very key figures within sports to do virtual training via 10-minute micro-learning videos. Mm -hmm. And that was I was working on at the same time as I was working on my speaking career. They allow me to do those two things simultaneously. So fortunately for me and my partners, there is still some life left in that company and we're, we really mm -hmm. kind of put it on ice for now, but now it's continuing to come back. I always thought that was the case, but I've always wanted to be really more of a, a, a two-headed monster here and being able to do things with my partners and then also have an independent career. And so as I began looking at, okay, what does the independent career look like? Uh, it became obvious that I was not going to do in-person two-day and three-day training sessions. So I thought, well, what keynote made the most sense? I had never created a keynote before. Mm -hmm. So I began to look at, okay, what constitutes a keynote? And I looked back at the things that I had learned during my tenure as a trainer. And one of the things that kept coming back again and again was that the one thing that seemed to keep people back from the success that they deserved was this stuff between their ears. It was their, the voices that they heard in their heads that were negative, that were helping them to fail at certain things and were not, they were not allowing those voices to help them succeed. And so literally I wrote a, a stage version of a keynote, which I called the seven voices in your head. Mm -hmm. And it's a very intriguing title and of course conjures up lots of different things in the heads of others. And I got to perform it one time in front of my friends and neighbors at our local church in front of three or four video cameras so I could have then a demo tape to bring around to speakers bureaus and those people who would hire me. And so I got that done and then COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And so I had to figure out how to bring that talk into the virtual stage. And it took the better part of the summer but mm -hmm. I figured it out and I've got, on the stage, I had a voice that comes from this speaker over here and a voice from this speaker over here. There were sound effects. I even did a musical, pre uh, uh, actually I performed on piano on stage with the seven voices singing behind me in perfect harmony. It was a production, wow. but I couldn't do that virtually. So I had to figure out how do you make that happen virtually. And so I actually have that done and I can't be more pleased with how it turned out. And so the seven voices in your head now exists on the virtual stage, which is pretty cool. Okay. So now you piqued everybody's curiosity to just see what is it like? Because a virtual keynote is not just you talking on a Zoom session about a topic. It, it's no. way beyond that. And do you want to give us a little preview, a little sample of what's involved in this virtual keynote? You know, it'd be fun. If you don't mind, I'll be glad to do that. It Absolutely. would give people an idea of what might be possible in their world too. And so if we pretend now I'm kind of got the curtain over it and now I'm in my virtual keynote self. So we're talking about the seven voices. And so let's listen to, let's, let's see if we can't be introduced to voice number one. Wow, they have such a nice car. That is such a great outfit. I'm so jealous. Look at what they're eating and they're so skinny. How does that happen? Has anyone heard that voice before? I am the voice of comparison. Comparison. We're always looking over the fence at somebody else's yard to see how their grass is greener than yours. Looking at somebody else's car to see if it's shinier or newer than yours. You're looking at everybody's Zoom screen around you to see who's got the coolest background behind you. This voice of comparison has some, but sometimes been called the terrible twos. No, 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 no not T-W-O, no, T-O-O. -O. The terrible twos sound something like this. I'm too slow. Too uneducated. Too short. Too indecisive. Too average. Too picky. Too impatient. Too quiet. Too clumsy. Too critical. Too smart for my own good. Everyone Everybody else gets, gets more likes, likes than me. I wish I still had a full head of hair like him. I'm still single and she's getting married again. <laughs> 
Science says that up to 10% of our total thoughts every day are comparison thoughts. And you know where this happens the most? The bathroom mirror? No, no, social media, of course. You've all seen on Facebook when someone, someone you know posts a photo that you know isn't their life at all. You say, I know this person, that's not who they are. It's more like fake book, not Facebook. Now wait a minute. What about all those salespeople you train? Don't they have to compare themselves to some standard of performance? Well, of course, all of us have to, particularly in that profession of sales. In fact, many of the teams I work with have something like this in each one of their offices. This is called a hustle board. This is the type of place where on the left-hand side, each person's name on the sales team is there. And on the right-hand side are all of the measures of success that each of them have. When you're in sales, you have to measure yourself against other people to be able to know how well you're performing or stacking up. But this lifestyle isn't for everyone. I mean, how many of you just had a panic attack thinking about your name being on the hustle board? It's not for everyone. The voice of comparison manifests itself differently in all of us. And sometimes we hear that brain invader and it begins to eat us alive. But there are ways in which to overcome this voice of comparison. So I'd like to share with you three different ways in which you can overcome your voice of comparison and get past those terrible twos of your own. Bam. Okay. So out of that into where we were. So is that helpful? That's, that's very helpful and it's so creative and it's not just you talking, but there's the sound effects, there's the, the acting out, the gestures. That's absolutely wonderful. I really enjoyed it's it. I'm sure everybody do. else, what, what's that? Thank you, it's really fun to do. I call these my puppets over here, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is really fun. And, and what we've done is, is we're working with corporations to be able to actually insert the voice of one or more of their people. Oh, wow. Be That's... the voices. So you could actually have your boss be the voice of comparison. Mm -hmm. We would pre record his or her voice and put it in place of what I have here. And so they actually hear their own people as a part of the presentation. Because the best part of keynotes is when you personalize it for the audience and it's not yeah. the canned speech. That's great. Yes. And, now, and that's another differentiator between keynoting and training. You may not personalize it as much because some of the same tenets of training may be the same no matter what your group is. But when you're dealing with a keynoter, a professional keynoter, really should be targeted and, and somehow customized and maybe not fully mm -hmm. customized, but as I call it, it custom tailored mm -hmm. to that customer that you're working with. And, and I always tell everybody though, the most important thing is the audience. And even if it's a training, any type of speech, you want to know your audience and speak to them rather than think about what right. you want to tell them. It has That's to right. be, like and you even, said right in the beginning, it has to be a story or information that resonates with them so they know that you didn't just walk in there with your canned speech. Right. You, you took them into account. And what I will do when I provide this particular keynote is I will interview half a dozen people that work in that particular mm -hmm. place and find out those certain key phrases that are used all the time in their hallways and throughout their work and, and actually bring those in and put them into the presentation. Often people will come back afterwards and say, man, it was like he was right next to us. He, what, he, is he been like ghosting us for the last six months? He said exactly what we've been saying. And what it really takes is asking the right questions and waiting long enough for the answers. And making it relevant. Yes. Now, yes. Bill, let's move on to something else because you Please. know I'm a speech language pathologist and yes. I focus a lot on their voice. And I must say, you do have a radio voice. And so I, I could see why you started that way in your career. At this point in your career, what do you do to take care of your voice? Or do you? You know, it's sometimes I overdo it. And my wife has to tell me, stop. It's actually been part of the value of not being able to go to sporting events is the mm. fact that I haven't been able to yell as much at the ah. stadiums. And so it's actually been a positive for my voice. And I do have to watch the volume and the limit to mm -hmm. which I have. I had done mm -hmm. some singing for a time. I'm now mm -hmm. doing less of that because it does take a toll. And mm -hmm. so it, it literally becomes more of a, uh, an understanding, a conscious pulling back mm -hmm. of knowing where your limits are at your voice and you know, not being stupid about it. And I don't mean to be condescending, but mm -hmm. you know, sometimes people can just be just raving fans and just go nuts and yell and shout and scream and whistle and, and do things knowing full well that it might damage what they have. And 
I don't have any specific regimen that I have for mm -hmm. vocal care. Mm -hmm. All I know is that I now, especially in this era of COVID, have more at, to, at stake with this voice than I ever mm -hmm. have before. Mm -hmm. And so I measure my I measure my words. I only spend so much time per day in front of cameras like this. And so mm -hmm. I pace myself. And uh, we often, in my field, often call it even taking vocal naps, just resting your voice at times. Don't talk nonstop if you have a virtual training later that day. Give yourself time to rest, drink fluids, and take care of your voice. Vocal um, naps, I love that. I'd not heard that before, but I, I yeah, think that's probably appropriate. Give your voice a rest. Yeah. Right? We have to. We, we would do that if we were running a marathon and practicing. We take breaks sometimes and just take it easy or take a day off. We can't now, take did, a whole uh, day off. I, I took a job that I shouldn't have taken during COVID. And this is an example of not taking care of your voice well enough. Uh, for a time, as I was fishing for what the next big thing was uh, the, over the summer, one of the things that I was encouraged to do was voiceover work, uh, mm. being able to do commercials and book readings and things like that and voiceover things for people that needed a voice for a certain type of, of a tape or whatever they were doing. And I took a job for a, I think it was a 20,000 word book mm. that needed to be done in a certain period of time. And I put it off too long and I was, you know, down to the last minute and I'm just bullying. I'm trying to make this thing work. And I'd had some takes that didn't turn out so well because the microphone mm -hmm. was tilted funny. And so I had to do that again. So I have more words here. And I tell you, it took me a day or so to recover mm -hmm. from that stupidity on my part. Mm -hmm. And I've just gotten out of the whole voiceover thing altogether because of it, because it's really not something I want to pursue full time or to do any further because it is very taxing and you, know, you only have so many of these words every day. And your voice is a precious instrument that you need to deliver your keynotes or your training. We have to think about that. Yeah, yeah, great so, way to put that. Else. I'm gonna remember that, vo put the vocal naps. I will vocal remember. naps. And we talked about something once before and we're demonstrating some of that here today. And that is, do you stand or do you sit? And what are your thoughts? And you told me a little bit, and I'd like to talk about this again, about even in the radio industry, <laughs> when you're on radio, some yep. of the thoughts about sitting and standing. Tell me what your thoughts are about that. Well, for the longest time in radio, people sat down. If you look mm -hmm. at any of the older uh, videos from the 40s and 50s, 60s, even early 70s, people were, you know, their DJs were sitting down delivering mm -hmm. their news or the, you know, the patter that they had between records. And what was, there was, the, the lore of radio is that uh, one individual in a major market was caught sleeping in his chair mm -hmm. and there was a significant amount of dead air because he was the only one in the studio. It was an overnight mm -hmm. kind of shift and so nobody else was there to, uh, to wake him up. And so after several minutes of this, the general manager of the station had to come down and wake him up and turn the rec record mm -hmm. on. And, and he said, from now on, we're getting all the furniture out of the studio. And so all of the chairs were removed. And what they found from that, and it would have been easy to figure out for those who study this stuff like you, is that you know when you stand, the diaphragm is at a different level. Uh, it mm -hmm. allows for more breath to be able to be exerted and you have a better tonal quality. And mm -hmm. especially in top 40 DJ kinds of very high energy stations, uh, you need to stand up. Today, you'd be hard pressed to find any radio station that has a single chair in any of their studios because they have all now figured out that standing up allows for better breaths, better vocal uh, support, and a deeper, richer tone. And more energy. I mean, some people, and I've watched people do this, even on phone calls, when they get up for that phone call, if they walk around as opposed to sit in the, their desk, their voice is stronger. They sound like they have more energy. Sometimes they think better. And I think yeah. you can, and I can speak to this too, when you're, if you're teaching or doing training and you're standing up, you just have more energy. You gesture more than you do if you're sitting at your desk looking at the yes. camera. I admit that I'm not much of an exerciser. I, and I know that's bad, but I, I just don't like it very much. It's not something I've gotten into the habit of. However, with my standing and with my training and working, I can tell you that, uh, that I have not gone to pot by any means. And, and it, there's as much activity that I'm doing 
not in an exercise sense, but unless, at least keeping myself limber and, and uh, not sedentary for sure by standing. And why are they talking about standing desks now? For one of those yes, reasons. It's like the big thing. Hey, right. look, you can Absolutely. stand up and you'll feel so much better. Gosh, we've been but doing this for a generation. Yeah, you'll feel better. You have more energy. You also have less back problems or, or neck problems because you're changing your position. And right. we can talk about this forever because, of course, I, I am so concerned <laughs> about the care of the voice and making sure you're doing things correctly. Uh, let me just ask you one other question, Bill. What, what are some pieces of advice that you received from people when you were starting out and some advice you'd want to share with newcomers to the speaking industry? I was fortunate enough early on, while I was still in radio, to have been a part of a committee that brought Mark Victor Hansen to my hometown. Mark is the author, the co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul books. Many mm -hmm. of you may know him. He and Jack Canfield partnered on dozens, maybe even hundreds of books, and they're one of the most prolific authors on the planet today. And I was the one who was designated to go up to O'Hare Airport to pick him up in the limo. And so I had the sign, you know, with Mark Victor Hansen on it and the whole thing as you're waiting for them, which was pretty cool. And so I escorted him to the limo and then we both got to ride in the limo on the way back. Well, it was an enormous traffic jam that day. And it was the very best traffic jam I've ever been in because it was two hours one-on-one -on -one with the man himself. Wow. And so I was able to really pick his brain a little bit because I was stuck. I felt like I was walking in peanut butter at the radio station. I had kind of been mired in mediocrity, didn't know exactly what direction to go. And Mark had given me so much great advice in that two hour ride. One of which was speak for free until you no longer have to speak for free. Hmm. And it's those people who say, well, where do I start? Well, start at your Rotary Club, Kiwanis, Lions, Elks, Moose, Masons, all of them need somebody to be able to speak to them almost on a weekly basis. And most of the time, it's not for profits who are speaking there that I want some money. So it'd be really nice to have somebody there that isn't asking for money to go and speak there. Uh, not that that's a bad thing, because certainly there are many, many very uh, worthy not-for-profits, but that's a great place in which to start. And so I took that literally because what he meant was allow those free talks to hone your craft so that you could be more valuable to those who would pay you to speak. Mm -hmm. He also told me to write down my goals, which I had never done up until that point. He asked me, well, where, where are your goals? He said, well, what do you want to do beyond radio? And I shared with him all those things that we talked about earlier. And, and uh, he said, well, have you got them all written down? I said, well, no, they're all right here in my head. No, 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 you've got to write them down. And he strongly encouraged me to write down 101 written goals. Wow. And Mark claims that that is the spiritual number of completion, 101. All of the chicken soup books have 101 stories in it. Hmm. I've read the Bible. I have no idea where 101 came from. I don't see any spiritual number with completion in there, 101, but that's what he says. And I took him at face value. And so it was around the New Year's time I happened to that first year, I, I said, okay, Mark, you're on, I'm gonna do this. So I took the half a bottle of wine that we didn't drink for New Year's Eve and I sat in a big chair and for a few hours, it took me to write out those 101 goals. And to this date, I'm at about the mid 80s mm. in the number that I've been able to achieve. One of which is to become a published author, which I've been very fortunate to now be twice. And I would tell you the power of writing something down mm. as a goal is not insignificant. It actually programs your brain to look for opportunities for those things to come true that you would not have seen had you not written that down. Now, I thought it was kind of fluff at the beginning, but I'm proof positive that it actually works. Wow, that's, that's great advice. So, so write down your goals. Know if you have a great story, but you need to practice it and don't just think you can show up and deliver it, but get some do some practice work, whether it's paid or not paid. Those are, those are two great pieces of advice. And also know how to, I don't want to use the word pivot, but know how to shift what you were doing before to adapt to the times, which all of us have had to do as speakers. Yes. So, Bill, I thank you for this interview. It's great information. I love your energy level. I love your voice. You have a great voice. So not only did you use it in radio, but you've been able to use it for your keynotes and your speaking. Thank you. So Lenny, thanks. You great work. We, I so appreciate the work that you're doing, both as a speech, speech pathologist, I can say that. That's a test. And <laughs> this program. And thank you for all the great work you're doing.